Hey guys, welcome to week nine in anatomy. Today we are going to take a look at the reproductive systems. Um, so it's similar to covering two chapters because we're looking at both the male and the female reproductive systems today. And we are looking at that though in one chapter. So it's kind of cool that your book does that because it, it just kind of makes it a little bit easier with it being just one chapter to focus on. Um, but we are gonna take a look at both of them. So let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna start with the male reproductive system today. So as I get this pulled up, um, I'm gonna introduce you to you know really the purpose of both reproductive systems um, and then get started with the male so uh, we are going to take a look at the structures and functions of the male reproductive system uh, with that we are also going to take a look at our hormonal control of the, of the male reproductive system um, so we know because of our introduction into hormones in our endocrine system chapter hopefully that is a little bit of a refresher to us. So let me go ahead and get started. So why do we have these reproductive systems? Um, hopefully the name of these systems helps to remember why we need reproductive systems. It's for reproduction. Uh, we wanna be able to produce an offspring. So the function is to produce, nurture, and transport our sex cells. So in the female, they are called ova, which is plural for an ovum, which is just another name for egg. So if you ever see the term ovum, O-V-U-M, it means egg, uh, and plural for that meaning many eggs would be ova. So the function of the female reproductive system is to produce, nurture, and transport those ova. And then the male reproductive system is to do the same with sperm. And the other function of our reproductive systems is to secrete different hormones. So we'll touch on all of those different hormones as we go through the chapter. So our primary reproductive organs, as again, hopefully this is a refresher to us from our endocrine system. Remember the term gonad simply means sex glands. So our sex glands in, and I'm sorry, in, in males, they are referred to as the testes. Again, we talked about how testes produce testosterone. Here we're also gonna talk about the production of sperm cells. And female gonads are called ovaries. In the endocrine system, we talked about its role in producing estrogen and progesterone. And here we're gonna not only touch on that again, but we are going to take a look at its role in producing an egg. So let's take a look then at that. Um, but before I do, I'm sorry, we should mention the gametes. Gametes just means uh, the cells that I'm referring to. So gametes, the sex cells that are produced by these gonads. In male, they're referred to as sperm. And then again, as I already mentioned, in females, they are called ova or eggs. So let's take a look at the male reproductive system. So again, the object is to produce, nourish, and transport sperm. The object is to take that sperm and deposit that within the female reproductive tract to eventually lead to fertilization of the egg, and then eventually leading to the production of an offspring. Uh, so that's, that's the idea in both reproductive systems is to do just that, is to develop an offspring. And the other part that we're gonna look at is the secretion of hormones. All right, so let's look at this. Here is the picture that you guys can see. This is the male reproductive system and the different structures we will see. Um, in this picture, you, this is what you all are seeing in your book. And then here are a couple of those structures that you'll see as we go throughout the PowerPoint. I'm actually guys, um, I'm gonna show you guys a different picture of this on the next slide that I'm gonna help you guys to label these different structures. And then we'll continue to talk about those as we go throughout the PowerPoint. So we're gonna see testes as our main organ, as we've already touched on that with testosterone production. Uh, we'll see some different ducts that this, you know, the sperm cells will travel through this kind of system of duct work here, these different tubes all along the pathway on its way out of the male reproductive system. Along that duct work, along that pathway, we're gonna run into some different glands. And hopefully remember the term glands means some type of secretion is coming from that gland. And here we are definitely gonna see some secretions from a couple different glands to help with the traveling of sperm, to help with the protection of sperm as it travels through the rest of this pathway and into the female reproductive tract. Uh, so we'll see a couple accessory glands and I'll talk to you guys about what those do. And then we're gonna see the external genitals and their role in reproduction. 
So let's take a look at this first. So here is a diagram that I'm going to have you guys label. So here, this will we'll walk through this first. Again, the, the purpose of me walking through this first is so that you guys can already have kind of a heads up on what these different structures are before we move forward with it in the PowerPoint. I think it's good to get a visual of something before we start talking about it. Then that way, it's not just brands banking new to us. So let's talk, up, talk about this and we'll label each of these. So looking first, the main organ in the male reproductive tract is one that we've already labeled before in our endocrine system, and that is number one, the testes. So number one, the testes, this is where we know again, not only is testosterone gonna be produced, but so will sperm cells. So number one, testes. Well, we're looking at one testy there, but there are, there are two of them. Okay, number two, the testes are actually held a little bit away from the body uh, in this um, kind of sac called the scrotum. Number two is called the scrotum. For spelling, it is S-C-R-O-T-U-M, scrotum. The reason why the testes are held away from the, the body here, uh, the, we know that internal body temperature is about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere kind of within that range, the, um, that body temperature is actually too hot for immature sperm cells. Here in the um, testes, the sperm cells actually are, again, they're immature as they're being developed and then they will slowly mature as they're make, making their way towards uh, these more internal structures. They actually will not be able to survive at such a hot temperature. So instead, they're held away from the body where the testes are gonna be kept a little bit cooler. So that's why the scrotal sac, or again, the scrotum here, holds those away from the abdomen. All right, now number three, number three is pointing to this area here between the scrotum and the anus. Again, this is the end of our digestive system that's being pointed out here. The anus, again, is the end point of digestion. But here, so this isn't really any type of organ. It's simply just this area of skin, so kind of an external structure here um, that's between, again, the scrotum and the anus, and that is called the perineum, P-E-R, yeah, P-E-R-I, N-E-U-M, the perineum. We're actually gonna see the same term given to the female area of skin between the vagina and the anus. We're gonna see the perineum come up again. So same term there. All right, now number four, number four going back over to the testes is pointing to these little tubules within the testes. It is actually here that sperm cells are gonna be produced and these are called the seminiferous tubules. So that is S-E-M-I-N-I-F-E-R-O-U-S. And then tubules is T-U-B-U-L-E-S. So these are called the seminiferous tubules. We'll see these come up again on the PowerPoint. So if I'm going kind of quickly for you, don't worry, you're gonna see these terms again, but the seminiferous tubules, as I mentioned, this is where sperm cells are gonna be created. It's in between those seminiferous tubules, so in the interstitial cells between those where testosterone is being created. We'll see that come up again on the PowerPoint. All right, once those, so within the, the seminiferous tubules, they're just now being produced and they are actually called immature sperm cells. I'll give you a term for that a little bit later, but those sperm cells are immature as they leave those seminiferous tubules. So as they exit the testes, they're gonna make their way into what looks like kind of a solid structure in this picture, but it's actually a very highly coiled up tube that sits on top of the testes here. And this is called the epididymis. So the epididymis is E-P-I-D-I-D-Y-M-I-S, the epididymis. As I mentioned, it is a very highly coiled up tubule that those, those immature sperm cells, when leaving the testes, will make their way into the epididymis, and it's there that it will slowly travel through that tube and then become mature sperm cells before it makes its way through the rest of the pathway here. That is the epididymis. Number six, number six, you can see is a big long tube that goes up and past the bladder. This is referred to as the vas 
difference, sometimes referred to as the ductus difference, and I'll give you both of them, but I think it's, tip, it's typically, I believe in your all's book, typically referred to as the vas difference. So vas is just V-A-S, and then different word, difference, D-E-F-E-R-E-N-S. So it's the vas difference that's going to travel up out of the epididymis and it's going to go up until it meets with the ejaculatory duct and I'll, I'll explain where that is. But again, some textbooks refer to it as the ductus difference, D-U-C-T-U-S. Ductus, like again, it's like kind of like a duct work that travels, you know, through the body here. So if you do ever see it that way, that is also correct. And you guys can use either term, but I believe in the PowerPoint, I think it's referred to as the vase. Either one is correct though. So what it's going to do, that vase difference is going to go up and past the bladder and it's actually going to meet up. The next part, it doesn't separate or anything, but it's going to actually turn into what's number eight, number eight is pointing to, uh, what number eight is pointing to. And that is just this different section of this tube. And we're going to refer to this now as the ejaculatory duct because it's, because it's right there, right before it meets up with the urethra. We know that the urethra is the tube that exits the bladder and travels through the length of the penis. Well, in the, you know, the case here, sperm is actually going to take the same pathway, but the tube that was called the vas deferens is actually going to be right before it meets that urethra. We're going to refer to it as the ejaculatory duct. So that's what number eight is pointing to. Right there at that ejaculatory duct, there are actually three different glands. So I mentioned earlier when I said the term gland, I meant that there's going to be some secretions that are going to go along with the sperm through this pathway. Um, in a male ejaculate, there are millions of sperm that are, you know, sent into the female reproductive system. Um, but with that, because the, the sperm cells are taking quite a journey, a way to think about it, quite a pathway that's going to be traveling through the very acidic urethra. If you think about it, urine is taking the same pathway. So there's a lot of acid that's going to be present in the urethra, but the female vagina is also very acidic too. So the sperm cells are actually going to need a lot of protection. Um, in the same case, there's also some fluid that's going to be present that's going to help to aid in the motility or movement of these sperm cells, giving the sperm cells the energy that they need in order to find their way to where they need to go in the female system. And I'll talk about that when we cover the female reproductive tract. So the three of these, as long as you kind of know those together, I'm, I'm going to point out what they are, but as far as what each one individually does, I'm not going to have you guys know that, but just that collectively the secretions, the fluids that come out of these glands is actually going to help the sperm cells in their pathway. So for protection and for movement. So, um, so actually an ejaculate, again, is not sperm by itself. When a male ejaculates, it is actually called semen because it is a mixture of not just sperm cells, but also these fluids that come from these different glands. So let me point out what these glands are. So number seven is pointing to what's called seminal vesicles. So there's two of them. There's one, you know, that kind of go on either side. So seminal is S-E-M-I-N-A-L. And vesicle is V-E-S-I-C-L-E. -E. So there's seminal vesicles. Oftentimes why this is referred to as semen, because we're seeing that, that term seminal. And then number 10 is pointing to underneath the bladder. I think we actually pointed this out in a previous chapter, uh, but number 10 is actually pointing to the prostate gland. Prostate, so P-R-O-S-T-A-T-E. P-R-O-S-T-A-T-E, -E. prostate. That's the prostate gland, there's only one of those. And then we have two of number 11. Number 11 is pointing to kind of a different, a tricky one. So I'm gonna spell this one for you. These are called the bulbal urethral glands. So that's B-U-L-B, -B, so like bulb, like a light bulb. O-U-R-E-T-H-R-A-L. These are called the bulbal urethral glands. So very tiny little gland right there. 
the majority of the fluid that's going to go along with sperm in this process is actually going to come from the seminal vesicles. But all three of these together, again, are going to help in the transport of the sperm through this pathway. And that pathway, again, is what number nine is pointing to, the urethra. as we know that term already. And it's gonna travel through the length of the penis, what number 12 is pointing to. 12 is pointing to the penis. At the tip of the penis, we have what's called the glans penis. So two different words, but G-L-A-N-S, glans penis. Very similar to what we're gonna identify as the clitoris in the female. This is just the sensitive erectile tissue found in the penis, whereas again, it's here that's gonna stimulate arousal and help to you know, begin the process of, of intercourse and again, eventually fertilization. But that's what number 13 is. The tip of the penis is referred to as the glans penis. And then lastly, number 14, we commonly uh, see this as what's called the foreskin. So you can refer to it as foreskin if you wish, or sometimes people call it the prepuce. So P-R-E-P-U-C-E. And if you call it foreskin, that's okay too. F-O-R-E-S-K-I-N. The foreskin is just the covering at the tip of the penis of, of, of mostly skin at the tip there. This is what's typically removed during circumcisions. Okay. All right, so just going through to make sure we have all these one last time. Number one is the testes. Number two is the scrotum. Number three is the perineum. Number four is the seminiferous tubules. Number five is the epididymis. Number six is the vas deferens, where it'll meet up with number seven, the seminal vesicle, before it becomes the, the ejaculatory duct. That ejaculatory duct is eventually gonna become number nine, the urethra. Number eight was the ejaculatory duct. It'll eventually become number nine, the urethra. But right there at the urethra, we're seeing secretions from the prostate gland, number 10, and number 11, the bulbourethral glands. Again, it's gonna travel through the length of the penis, number 12. The sensitive area at the tip of the penis is referred to as the glans penis. And the area of skin at the tip of the penis there is called the foreskin or prepuce. We will see all of these terms as we go through the PowerPoint. Again, I like to just give you guys kind of a heads up as we get rolling through these different terms. So again, the scrotum, the idea of the scrotum is to keep the testes at a lower temperature because body temperature is too warm. Um, so there's different lobules within there containing different, two different things, the seminiferous tubules as we labeled again as number four. And that's again, what is producing the sperm. Whereas in between those seminiferous tubules, we have interstitial cells that are secreting, gonna be what secretes testosterone. So that is the job of the testes. The process that's taking place within those sperm cell, I'm sorry, within those seminiferous tubules is a process of sperm cell creation. And that's what this term is right here, spermatogenesis. So genesis, we oftentimes refer to that as meaning creation. And so the creation of sperm cells is spermatogenesis. So without getting too deep into too much of biology and what all needs to happen here, Spermatogenesis, again, as long as you guys know that term is sperm cell creation. Immature sperm cells called uh, spermatogonia are going to mature into sperm cells called spermatocytes. So again, sites meaning cells, if you guys remember that from medical terminology. So sperm cells are also known as spermatocytes. What happens is there's a process in our body that cells go through that's a cell division. Specifically with sex cells, we call that cell division called meiosis. If anybody's heard of mitosis, this is actually very, very, very similar. Mitosis is typically what the majority of our other body cells go through, like our skin cells and blood cells, and they're, they're splitting. So I shouldn't say blood cells, but they're created in the red bone marrow, but like our skin cells. And we see that division and they split and become two. And then those two will then split and become four more. Cells will just continually split and divide. And that's what's happening at the basal layer of our skin. Um, meiosis is the same process that's taking place again with sex cells. And again, you guys do not have to know 
th this whole process. The reason why I'm telling you guys this is because a human being, a human cell, um, is made up of what's called uh, uh, chromosomes. Chromosomes is what gives us our genetic information. A human cell has 46 of those chromosomes. So what happens is in the process of meiosis, there's those spermatocytes will split and we're only going to see 23 chromosomes in each sperm cell. That is because an egg cell has the other 23. It is when those two unite and fertilize that that will then form a human being because 23 and 23 makes 46. So the, that's really the whole reason I've left this here. I don't want you guys to worry about the process of meiosis and any definition of that. The only really, ter the real term I want you guys to know from this slide is the one at the top, spermatogenesis, again, the creation of sperm cells. And in this whole creation of sperm cells, these spermatocytes, these mature sperm cells will eventually split and we'll see just 23 chromosomes, again, hoping to, at some point unite with an egg cell, which also has 23 chromosomes to fertilize and again, become an offspring. That is the idea here. Okay, so continuing to move forward here, let's talk about the, the sperm then, for instance, uh, you know, as we move further into this, I do want you guys to know some of the different parts of a sperm and what a sperm looks like. So here you're seeing the sperm structure down here at the bottom. Um, a sperm cell is made up of really three main parts. We're gonna see a head, a body, and a tail. The head is what contains the nucleus, which is the brain of a cell. I know we didn't go too deep into details about you know, nuclei, we didn't get into really kind of the breakdown of cells, but if you ever see the term nucleus, that's what that means. That's what houses all that genetic information. So the head contains that. This is the part that really needs to get to that egg cell. Um, there's a couple different things that are gonna help in that process. On the top of that, the head is what's called an acrosome. This is kind of like a helmet, a helmet that's made up of enzymes. These enzymes, if you remember when we talked about enzymes and digestion, enzymes are chemicals that are gonna help to speed up a chemical reaction. Enzymes and digestion, we were specifically talking about the breakdown of food. Enzymes here, on the acrosome, these enzymes are gonna to help to split open and break open that egg cell so that sperm cell can make its way in in order to fertilize it, to get that nucleus to where it needs to be. So that acrosome is gonna be what helps that fertilization process take place. So the head, again, is what contains the genetic information. The acrosome is gonna be what helps to split open that egg cell to get that sperm inside. The body and the tail are gonna help in the movement to get it to where it needs to go. So the body contains um, a part of a cell that gives it its energy is referred to as the mitochondria. And so the body of the sperm cell is what contains that mitochondria. So the body, all you guys really need to know about that is this is what's gonna give it the energy that it needs to move forward. So the body is the energy of it. And the tail, is also known as what's called a flagellum. That's this type of tail that's given in different sperm cells, um, but also with um, some bacterial cells have flagellum. It's again, it's a tail, but it's made up of different fibers that, that allow it to whip, that to whip, and that whip-like motion is gonna be its movement. So the tail is made up of flagellum, which is gonna, again, help to move it forward. So it's that head that needs to get to the egg cell, but the body and the tail are gonna help it get there. And the acrosome is then again, gonna break open that egg cell when it does get there. So I'd be familiar with those different parts of the sperm. Okay, so these arrows are just showing you the different, you know, the pathway that this is gonna take as we've already kind of been through this, but sperm will mature and gather nutrients and volume moving from the testes to the urethra. That's the idea, is to get from the testes, make its pathway all the way up and by the bladder, and then finally make its way out of the urethra. <laughs> the pathway that it takes, again, is the epididymis. It says there's two because they're on top of each testy. The vas deferens, there's two, connecting from the epididymis to go up past the bladder. There's one on the other side, connected to the other testy too. Ejaculatory ducts, there's two of those before the meet up with the urethra and then it meets up with the single urethra. So that is the different genital ducts that this sperm cell, these sperm cells will take on its path to, again, to the female tract. 
Again, as it mentioned on that previous slide, it's picking up volume as it makes its way through these ducts. And that volume is gonna come from those glands we discussed. So we mentioned the seminal vesicles, 60% of semen's volume is gonna be from the seminal vesicles. So again, remember we labeled that as number seven. The prostate gland was number, number 10, and it was around the upper urethra, so right at the proximal end of that urethra, right where it attaches to the bladder. And the bulbourethral glands were number 11. What happens is all of these glandular secretions are gonna mix with sperm and form what we'll call semen now, which is just the mixture of sperm and these different secretions. Again, as, long, as far as functioning of these guys, as long as you know that all three of these different glands, their job is to help protect sperm and help to move sperm, help to give it the energy and, and the movement that it needs. So the, the external genitals, again, the scrotum is what contains the testes, keeping it away from the body. The penis, which we labeled as number 12, as number 12 was the organ of copulation, which, is, which simply means intercourse. The shaft is going to uh, be what contains erectile tissue. The muscle within the penis does have the ability to become erect, and that's what's going to be, uh, give that penis the ability to provide or to perform intercourse. The glans penis, again, remember, is the sensitive area of the penis that's going to cause that arousal to take place. In the urinary meatus, we talked about this last week with the urinary system. The urinary meatus is the opening to the outside of the urethra located right in the center of the glans penis. And then the prepuce, or also known as foreskin, is the covering for the glands. Again, like I mentioned when I was showing you guys that on the diagram, this is what's typically removed during circumcision. Typically circumcision is just more of a religious type um, thing. It's just some people remove the foreskin and some people don't. There's really no benefit either way. They both work. A lot of times people will say that foreskin will not be able to be cleaned properly, but that's actually not the case. So it's just kind of who wants to do it and who doesn't. It's a very common occurrence in the United States. Most of the time people do uh, provide circumcision, but some don't. Totally up to you. All right, so the male sexual response is this. So what happens during an erection? So again, the glans penis is gonna be that sensitive area that helps to cause that arousal. What happens during an erection is blood engorges that erectile tissue, causing it to become erect. Um, intercourse then takes place. And what happens is, for the, here's the difference between what's called emission and ejaculation. Ejaculation we know is gonna be the removal of semen from the body. But emission is what happens first. This is gonna be the movement of semen from the genital ducts ducts into the proximal urethra. So the movement from that ejaculatory duct, and as soon as it moves into the top of the urethra, right there by the bladder, that is called emission. So it's the movement out of that duct and kind of getting ready for ejaculation. That is called emission. And then ejaculation occurs is the expulsion of semen from the urethra, so again, out of the body. The term orgasm is just pleasurable, pleasurable sensations at the height of sexual sensation. And the sexual response is under autonomic control. It is something that automatically happens. Okay. Um, so the effects of testosterone on the male. So this testosterone is gonna help with that sperm development. So as long as testosterone is being secreted the way that it should. Again, as long as we have that homeostasis, that, that normal level of testosterone, sperm will be developed as they should. Also responsible for primary sex characteristics, which would be the maturation, the enlargement of the penis and the testes. And then secondary sex characteristics, which kind of goes along with you know, not just involving the reproductive organs, but hair growth will increase um, and distribution of hair will, will be kind of all over the body for male. Uh, the voice will deepen. This is all taking place during puberty. Skin starts to thicken. Its glandular activity increases, such as like sweat glands, uh, and male physique will develop. So that is the effect that testosterone has on the male body.
So other hormones that are responsible for the male response would be what we talked about in the pituitary gland. Remember we talked about FSH and LH. The follicle stimulating hormone is gonna stimulate those seminiferous tubules within the testes to produce sperm. Whereas the luteinizing hormone is also in the same area, the pituitary gland, it is going to target those interstitial cells to secrete testosterone. Testosterone is a negative feedback control that once we're at that level of testosterone where you know the male needs to be, then it will be shut off again because that's a negative feedback. We don't want to produce too much testosterone. We get to the level where it needs to be and then it, it turns off. So hopefully those three hormones are a refresher for us. Okay, so let's get into the female reproductive system now. So the female reproductive system, again, a little bit more involved because we're gonna see the role of pregnancy and uh, the menstrual cycle as well. So let's take a look at what we're gonna see here. So we are gonna describe first the structures and functions of the female reproductive system. We're gonna take a look at the hormonal control, just like we saw with the male. And then we're gonna take a look at the structure of breast and its involvement in lactation after pregnancy. Um, and then I can't remember if I took these off. I think it, I think we finished up with this. I think I did leave those on there, the various methods of birth control. Okay, so the role in um, the female reproductive system, just like the male reproductive system to produce the gametes, the sex cells. So here it's the eggs or called ova to secrete hormones as well. So we'll talk about the effects of FSH and LH on now the female system as well as estrogen and progesterone. And then to nourish, protect, uh, and protect a developing baby during the nine months of pregnancy. Okay, so here is uh, the labeling diagram for the female reproductive system. So we'll talk about each of these structures as we go throughout the PowerPoint. I want to show you guys what typically happens here with these uh, ova. So number one is pointing to the, the gonads of the female system. Number one is pointing to the ovary ovary or ovaries, if you want to label as if there's two of them. And then number two is pointing to what's called the fallopian tubes, sometimes referred to as the uterine tubes as well. But we're going to see that more, more so as fallopian. So F-A-L-L-O-P-I-A-N, fallopian tubes. It is here that the I'm trying to explain it a little bit better because it looks like in this picture that the fallopian tube is connected to the ovary and it's actually not. And I'll see, we'll see a better diagram of this as we will see a frontal viewpoint of the female reproductive system here in just a few minutes. But when the egg leaves the ovary, it will then make its way into the fallopian tube. And it is actually here where um, fertilization will actually occur right there in that fallopian tube. Once that fertilized egg, once it's been fertilized, it will then slowly make its way into number three, that muscular organ there is called the uterus. The uterus. All right, and then it will implant itself into the wall of that uterus, uh, eventually again becoming a fetus and will develop for nine months. And that, that uterus will grow with that growing and developing fetus. We'll talk a little bit more about the uterus as we get deeper into the PowerPoint. Number four, this is kind of a um, interesting term and I can't remember if your all's book actually identifies this or not. Um, but there's a couple different terms given to it. So we'll, we'll label, I'll show you both of them. Um, I've seen this in different places, uh, but an, an old book used to refer to this as what's called the cul-de-sac, which I think of when I think of like a court in a neighborhood. So it's kind of a funny term to me, but even on the wall of a doctor's office, when I was looking at the female anatomy, it was referred to that the same way. Uh, so if you are gonna identify this as co what's called the cul-de-sac, it's C-U-L, dash de dash sac cul-de-sac whereas a little bit easier i have also seen another book refer to this as what's called the recto uterine pouch because it's the area of space as you guys can see between the rectum and the uterus and so it's labeled accordingly so sometimes people refer to that as the recto uterine pouch so if you were if you're using that as that might be easier to remember um, it's r-e-c-t-o 
U T E R I N E, recto uterine is that name, and then pouch, P O U C H, recto uterine pouch. So either one is fine by me as far as how you want to identify that. Okay, so let's get back into this pathway. So this is the, we call it number three was the uterus. The opening to the uterus is actually already identified for us, but it is gonna be something that is important during pregnancy. Uh, it, it is what opens up before label, uh, label labor begins, and that is the cervix. The cervix is the opening to the uterus. So I would be familiar with that term too. After that then, the, um, as we continue moving down this pathway, number six is pointing to the vagina. I'm sorry, number five is pointing to the vagina. And number six is actually pointing to what looks like two tiny little yellow dots on this diagram. It is actually pointing out these are glands. These glands are going to produce a secretion that's going to help during intercourse to provide a lubrication for that process. Number six is referred to as the Bartholin glands. B-A-R-T-H-O-L-I-N apostrophe S. Bartholins, they were named according to the scientists that discovered these. Um, so that's, that's why they're named that way. So Bartholin glands is named after the guy named Bartholin. Kind of silly, I think. But... So those are the Bartholin glands. Number seven is pointing to the clitoris, C-L-I-T-O-R-I-S, clitoris. And this is very similar to the glands penis in the male. This is the sensitive erectile tissue for the female. And number eight, that same term that we saw in the male, the, the area there between the vagina and the anus is referred to as the perineum, P-E-R-I-N-E-U-M again. Okay, so just making sure we have these different uh, structures here. Number one is the ovary. If you labeled it as ovaries, that's okay. There are two of them in most females. Number two, the fallopian tubes or fallopian tube, if you're just looking at the one. Number three is the uterus. Number four is either the cul-de-sac or the rectouterine pouch. Number five is pointing to the vagina. Number six, those are the Bartholin glands. I think, I think uh, I've seen another book refer to those as the vestibular glands. And if you wanna, if you've seen it that way, that's okay. But later in the PowerPoint, we will see them as Bartholin glands. So that's why I labeled them that way. So number six are the Bartholin glands. Number seven is the clitoris and number eight is the perineum. Okay, let's move forward here and keep talking about the female reproductive system. Okay, so the ovaries. The ovaries function is to, just like in the um, male system, we'll see how meiosis is gonna reduce those chromosomes from 46 to 23. Again, we just want that egg cell to only contain 23 chromosomes, as again, the sperm cell will contain the other 23 to form the human uh, cell, again, made up of 46 chromosomes. L8, I'm sorry, FSH first, um, is going to be what stimulates the ovum to become what's called the graphene follicle. If you happen to remember when I talk about a little bit with the FSH, again, that's the follicle stimulating hormone. Here's what's happening um, in the process of, just in, in this picture that you guys are seeing here. So I can explain a little bit about what's, what these different terms are referring to. Um, a female is born with all of these immature egg cells they're not matured yet but we're we're always or we're i should say not always but we're born with all the eggs that we will ever produce millions of them two millions i don't i don't remember exactly the number but we're, we're born with millions of these different follicles um what's going to happen is month to month what we do is we typically will produce or mature a couple of those and usually only one will fully mature uh, and that's what's happening here in the ovary, is this kind of process that you're seeing here is what's happening over the course of about a month. Um, so we'll take these immature egg cells and we'll see there's the egg, the oocyte there. And we'll see all around it, we have this fo these follicular cells. And this is what's gonna help to mature that egg cell as it goes through this process here. Um, this, the secretion of the follicle stimulating hormone will target that follicle and make it what's called the graphene 
ovarian follicle, which you can see is it's getting a lot bigger. So it kind of makes the uh, ovary look like it has a little blister on the side of it. Eventually what it's doing is it's getting closer to the edge here. And during this process of ovulation, what happens is that follicle opens up. What happens is at that point, LH, is secreted. LH, again from the pituitary gland, is called the uh, luteinizing hormone, and it's going to be what stimulates ovulation in the female. So the extruded ovum will be swept into the fallopian tube, which was the next part of the diagram there. And the follicular cells here in the ovary will become what's called the corpus luteum. Luteum, can't talk today. Corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is just, again, what will then eventually kind of fall off, or not fall off, but um, without the egg, it now becomes, it usually, it, the corpus luteum means yellow body, which means it just will um, kind of start this whole process over again. In the event that there is a fertilization, it will not. If that, that egg that was just released then gets fertilized by a sperm, there's going to be other hormones that are going to be secreted called progesterone. Progesterone is actually going to target the ovary to tell it not to produce FSH and LH anymore, or at least during the next nine months. So what happens is if pregnancy does not occur, then what happens is this whole process starts over again. In the absence of progesterone, then what happens is, again, the, the process will start all over again, FSH will be secreted, and again, target that egg cell to be matured and eventually released during ovulation. We'll take a look exactly at that uh, cycle here in just a minute. But that's what's happening within the ovaries. So our ovarian hormones that are also being secreted by the ovaries, we one, have estrogen. This is gonna also help to promote the maturing or maturation of those egg cells. Um, it also is going to be what provides the secondary sex characteristics for females. Uh, so the maturation of the reproductive organs as well as breasts, the characteristic uh, fat distribution that females have, widening of the pelvis as well as menstruation, and the closure of the epiphyseal discs and long bones. So meaning at this point, we're typically done growing once that, in, during puberty. Uh, so the epiphyseal discs, remember, is the growth plate, what we saw when we were talking about bones. And in those long bones, once those are closed, it means that that person is done growing. And typically that's the case with females once they go through puberty. Whereas progesterone will work with estrogen to establish that menstrual cycle, so helps in that process too, we'll take a look at that, you know, that cycle itself. Helps to maintain pregnancy. So during pregnancy, we talked about that with progesterone in our endocrine system chapter, that it helps to develop the uterus, to help that uterus grow and develop with the developing offspring. And it helps to prepare the breasts for milk production right after pregnancy. So progesterone is what is happening, or is, is another hormone that's being secreted there. So hopefully that's just a refresher for us. We'll talk about uh, some of these hormones in more detail a little bit later on. Okay, so here's that better viewpoint of the female tract that I wanted to point out to you guys. So here we're looking at a frontal viewpoint. This angle helps us to see uh, a little bit different from that sagittal or side view we were looking at in our labeling sheet. Um, but here you can see that the ovary is not directly connected to this fallopian tube, that this is actually what this looks like. Here in the middle, we have the uterus. Here's the vagina. You can see lined with rugae, just, uh, rugae, just like the stomach and the bladder. And that's what allows for the widening of that for either during intercourse to accept the penis, but also in, is it's the birth canal. So to allow a baby to travel through that, that's going to allow that stretching to occur. So here we're seeing that, but you can see these ligaments that, keeping, that are keeping the ovary in place that is attached to the uterus there. But during ovulation, what happens is <coughs> an egg is released. And in that release of that egg, it will then be grabbed up by these finger-like ends of the fallopian tube called fembrae. We're going to identify these on the next slide, but you can see it pointed out over here on the right side of the genital tract here. The fembrae are going to, just like fingers, they're going to grab up that egg cell and then put it into the fallopian tube. And it's here within these fallopian tubes that that egg will make its way towards the uterus, whether it's fertilized or not. If sperm cells are present, then hopefully that you know, will, be, will be fertilized and will be fertilized here within the um, fallopian tubes. Um, from there, it will make its way, and since it's fertilized, it will then implant itself into the wall of the uterus. 
if it is not fertilized, what will happen, it will still make its way to the uterus, but during the process of menstruation, since hormones are telling the body to, you know, we're not pregnant, so therefore we need to have a period, we'll talk about that, but that egg cell will then be lost during that menstrual cycle. This, this is the uterus, so here's just a frontal view of the uterus. These terms here, endometrium, myometrium, and parametrium, are going to be very important. We'll talk about the structure of the uterus here in just a minute, and I'll come back to this to talk about that. And then the vagina, as I just mentioned, that is the pathway that a penis will, will take to get into the body, but also the, you know, once that fetus grows and develops here within the uterus, eventually during labor that the head of the fetus, if it's being born the right way, will make its way through the vagina here. So that rugi, again, lining that, we know that rugi, just like in the stomach and the bladder, helps to widen those organs, help them to stretch, and so we're, we're gonna need the, the vagina to do the same thing. And here are those Bartholin glands that we pointed out earlier uh, in our diagram. And those are, again, gonna simply just provide a secretion that provides a lubrication for the vagina here. All right, so those fallopian tubes. Fallopian tubes begin at the fimbrae. The fimbrae, those finger-like ends, are going to sweep the ova into the tubes. They're not directly attached to the ovary. It is here, that is the site of fertilization. So in the presence of sperm cells, this is where the, again, the, the egg, once it, you know, ovulation occurs, it'll be a couple days that that egg actually hangs out in the fallopian tubes. It's actually, there's um, some cilia. If you remember cilia or ciliated wall there, when I use the term cilia, um, I don't remember if I talked to you guys about that with the respiratory tract, I should have. But cilia is what lines the inner, um, of the inner part of this tract, it was something that um, is in the respiratory tract too. They're tiny little hairs that line um, in, in, and provide kind of a sweeping motion. And cilia in the respiratory tract are designed to trap um, to make sure things don't make its way into the lungs, but also will provide kind of a sweeping like motion so that anything we do inhale, we actually will then swallow and anything then can be uh, destroyed in the hydrochloric acid in our stomach. Cilia here in the fallopian tubes are designed to kind of sweep the egg towards the uterus. We're also going to see, because the fallopian tubes are lined with smooth muscle, we're also going to see peristals peristalsis taking place uh, here within the fallopian tubes to help push it towards the uterus. Again, it will usually be there, the egg will be there one to two days as it hangs out waiting for sperm um, in the event that, again, either sperm do come and fertilize it or not, it will make its way towards the uterus. So it is the, the fallopian tubes are the site of fertilization and it's gonna be what carries the ovum to the uterus, as I mentioned. So some tube troubles. What happens in, um, there are certain issues that, that some females experience. Uh, in the event that a fertilized ovum implants itself into the fallopian tube instead of the uterus, if it doesn't make its way to the uterus and instead it stays within the fallopian tube, this is what's called an ectopic pregnancy. Um, what will happen if that baby grows, the, the fallopian tube is not designed to grow the way that the uterus is. So if that will actually grow in the fallopian tube, it will actually cause an extensive amount of damage to the fallopian tube. It will cause the fallopian tube to rupture. So typically that pregnancy will have to be, um, there will be surgery to remove that. Um, scarring and blockage of the fallopian tube sometimes happens, typically caused by uh, repeated STDs. Uh, a lot of STDs are very symptomless, like diseases like um, chlamydia or gonorrhea sometimes don't have symptoms that go along with it. And so because of that, sometimes females go for a long period of time without knowing they even have an STD. And that can cause some damage to the fallopian tubes, can sometimes lead to some scarring of the fallopian tube um, and blockage of the fallopian tube. So this is oftentimes a very a major cause of infertility in females. And then pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID, is where the genital tract will open directly into the sterile pelvic cavity. Okay, so those are just a couple fallopian tube issues that you may have heard of. 
So looking at the, the uterus itself, the uterus has very similar terms that are given to the stomach. Uh, so there's a fundus, so the top part, that kind of humped part. And then the body of the uterus is just the big main part of the uterus. And then the cervix is the opening down at the end, just before it gets to the vagina. The layers of the uterus, I do want you guys to know these. The inner layer is called, so everything you can see ends in the word metrium but the different prefixes are given to where these layers are. The inner layer of the uterus is called the endometrium. The muscular middle layer, so this is what will contract during labor, this is called the myometrium. Hopefully all of these prefixes are familiar as we saw all of these prefixes when we were naming the, label, the, the layers of the heart. If you remember the endocardium and myocardium, these are the same, very same prefixes, but just for the uterus. So the outer layer is then referred to as the parametrium. And we know the uterus will connect at the vagina at the bottom and the fallopian tubes at the top. So different connections to the uterus. So going back to the picture so you guys can see that again, there is the uterus. So again, the inner lining is called the endometrium. We will talk about the menstrual cycle here in just a second, but it is actually this entire layer of the uterus that in the event that fertilization does not occur and a female is not pregnant, that will stimulate hormonal secretion telling the body that we're not pregnant and that will cause a, a, a period to take place. And it's actually this endometrium that is actually lost during that period. So it kind of sheds itself and then that way it's going to build itself back up again to prepare itself for the next month cycle. Again, that's what the female body is really essentially designed to do is to, you know, to carry and nurture and uh, uh, nourish an offspring. So that's what the uterus is really getting itself ready for. So if there's no pregnancy, it will shed the inner lining and then build itself back up again and do the same thing every month until a fertilization occurs. So that's where the period comes from. So that's the endometrium. This muscular portion of it is called the myometrium. And then the outer layer is called the parametrium. All right, uh, let's see, so going back. So the external genitals also, is also referred to as what's called the vulva. If you, if you hear the term vulva, it just means the outside genitals in the female. There's different components to the vulva. Um, when you're looking at these different kind of uh, flap-like structures, the larger one is called the labia majora. The smaller internal one is referred to as the labia minora. So when you see labia, it's just referring to these structures over here on the sides. The mons pubis is kind of the mostly adipose tissue, so fat tissue up at the top. So there's the mons pubis at the top there. The clitoris we know is the sensitive tissue in the female. Um, and then the vestibule, don't worry about the vestibule, but you see it's referring to those vestibular or, or Bartholin glands. I believe that's what that's referring to. We call those the Bartholin glands. But also visible is the urethra. You can see the opening for the urinary tract. Oh, and there you can see they have the opening to the Bartholin glands. They again are referring to those as the vestibular glands on the diagram. You can see those two little dots down there, kind of hard to tell but those are the Bartholin glands. The perineum, the structure between the vagina and the anus is again, that is the area of skin. It is typically um, in the event that a child's head is way too big, sometimes this is cut. There's an incision made into the perineum. They typically try to make a sideways cut so it doesn't cut into the anus, but that will sometimes make that easier for the, that uh, baby's head to make its way through. That is referred to as an episiotomy, just FYI. Not that you guys have to know that. That is the perineum, and then also visible is the opening to the vagina. But these are all referred to as the external genitals are called the vulva. So hormones play a big role in the female reproductive cycles. So there's a number of hormones that control the female reproductive cycle. Uh, unlike male hormones, female hormones occurs on a monthly cycle. So it kind of changes from month to month, whereas males kind of had a, have a steady flow of testosterone and the, the FSH and LH. Whereas females, it changes on a month to month basis because of the, again, building up of the uterus and then removal of the uterine lining and getting everything ready again. Same thing with what's happening inside the ovaries. 
So it's a, it's a regular pattern of increases and decreases in those hormone levels. So that's why females experience mood swings and you're, we're constantly changing because that's what's happening inside of our body is different hormone st structures. So the purpose of these reproductive cycles is to mature an egg monthly for fertilization. So there's two cycles that work together and we'll see both of them. We have the ovarian cycle. So what's happening inside the ovary and then what's happening inside the uterus. And there's different hormones that control these different changes. A typical reproductive cycle in a female is about 28 days. It changes from person to person. Some people have shorter cycles, some people have longer ones, but this is the average number of days that this will last. And it's over this 28 day period, that we're seeing these different changes occur. So the follicular phase is the first part of the ovarian cycle. So here we're talking about what's happening inside the ovaries. So what's affecting the ovary is the stimulation of FSH and LH. FSH, as we talked a little bit about earlier, triggers the maturing or maturation of the follicle or the ovum. So here you can see in this follicular phase, what's happening is this immature egg cell is slowly you know, becoming this ovum becoming a mature egg cell with the, you know, the follicle being built up around it. The follicle will secrete estrogen and estrogen will nourish that ovum, um, also stimulating the uterine lining being built up. We'll, we'll talk about that in the uterine cycle. Um, at mid-cycle, the surge of LH that's coming from the pituitary gland will stimulate the release of that, o that ova again in the process of ovulation. And that egg will again be eventually grabbed up by the fimbrae of the fallopian tube where it will make its way through there. What then happens in the ovaries after that, after the egg is released, it becomes the corpus luteum. So we're seeing that in what's called the luteal phase. So the corpus luteum will secrete the hormone progesterone. Progesterone is going to target the uterine wall, telling it to build up the lining of the uterus because we're trying to implant that egg hopefully it's going to be fertilized we're trying to implant that egg into the wall of the uterus the luteal phase will progress differently in when when either the female becomes pregnant or not pregnant in the event that the female is pregnant that will again will that female will continue to produce progesterone to continue to build up the wall of the uterus in the event that the female does not become pregnant then progesterone secretion will cut off and the absence of progesterone will then tell the uterus to do something else. Instead, we'll see the menstrual period take place. So this is what happens here. So the uterine cycle in phases, we'll see the menstrual endometrial lining is shed. So there's, you're, you're seeing the, pre, the term menses there, which means the monthly period. So menses is just the uterine lining being lost. In the proliferative phase, here, estrogen is going to thicken that uterine lining. So it's going to build up the wall of that uterus in these, these next couple days. In the secretory phase, then we're seeing progesterone will then nourish that endometrium. So again, after the release of the egg cell, then that's going to, tar that's going to um, you know, tell that corpus luteum to secrete progesterone. It will continue to secrete progesterone to build up the wall of the uterus. If an egg cell does not plant, implant itself into the wall of the uterus, then we will instead see this cycle start all over again. In the event that, again, something does get implanted into the wall of the uterus, we do have a fertilized egg there, then instead the corpus luteum will continue to secrete progesterone, causing it to then nourish the wall of the uterus there and nourish, again, that developing will eventually become the fetus again and then telling the uterus not to secrete fsh therefore will not create a new egg so that that's why there's no no chance of pregnancy during pregnancy so that's what's happening with all our our egg cells there so that's kind of following up with what i just mentioned so the corpus luteum dead or alive how do we know what happens without an egg cell being fertilized so without that fertilized ovum the the corpus luteum will die so that, therefore it will not secrete any progesterone anymore. So plasma levels of ovarian follicles will start to decline. And without that hormonal support, without that progesterone, the uterine lining will then slough off. We know that as menses or menstrual period. 
in the event that the ovum does become fertilized and female does become pregnant, then what happens is the fertilized ovum will secrete its own hormone called HCG, the human chorionic gonadotropin. So this is coming from the fertilized egg itself. This is not something that the female produces on its own. It's coming from the fertilized egg. So it secretes its own hormone. The HSG will sustain that corpus, corpus luteum, in, luteum in the ovary, therefore continually secreting progesterone, therefore persisting and maintaining the uterine lining. Okay. So in summary, that's what's happening. In a non-pregnant female, so the corpus luteum will die. So the corpus luteum, and, and that's okay because it's gonna die off and eventually we'll see it again uh, next month. So the corpus luteum is dead. The uterine lining loses its hormonal support and therefore will slough off, resulting in a period. The cycle will start again as declining ovarian hormones will trigger FSH and we'll see that cycle happening all over again in the ovary and then all over again in the, in the uterus. In the event that the female is pregnant, then the corpus luteum will remain alive, secrete progesterone and estrogen. Hormones are going to sustain that inner wall of the uterus called the endometrium. And the early embryo will implant itself into the wall of that endometrium in, within the uterus. So just a couple different terms that go along with this. Menarche is the first period that, uh, of a menstrual bleeding during puberty. So this happens anywhere between the ages of 11 and 15, I don't know, I, I think it's, it's, sometimes it's, I feel like it's getting younger and younger, um, but you know, and a young girl is going through puberty, the very first period is referred to as a menarche. Whereas then from there on out, every menstrual cycle is referred to as menses, or every menstrual period, I should say, is referred to as menses. The term menopause is given to females who then have a decrease in those ovarian hormones. When they start to decline, therefore menstrual periods will decrease and eventually cease, no longer having a menstrual period anymore, which a lot of times people think is fantastic, um, but there are a lot of other systemic effects. Uh, for anybody who knows anyone who's gone through menopause or if you yourself has gone through menopause, there are hot flashes, mood swings, all kinds of other issues that go along with it. So a lot of times, uh, females who go through menopause typically get on estrogen supplements or patches uh, in order to regulate their hormones in their body. So the female breast is considered, um, the, the mammary gland is considered an accessory structure to reproduction, although it's, it doesn't have anything to do with development of egg cells or anything of that nature. But because of its role in nourishing the offspring, we do consider it part of the female reproductive tract. So the mammary gland has different lobes in it. There's different alveolar glands within the lobes that are gonna be what secretes the colostrum and milk into what's called lactiferous ducts. The nipple and the surrounding area around the nipples referred to as the areola. And the breast is held in place by different suspensory lig ligaments that are gonna hold that in place. But again, the role of the breast is to you know, provide, lact it's gonna lactate and again, to help feed that offspring after pregnancy has occurred. Hormones involved in the process of lactation would be estrogen and progesterone. This is gonna prepare the breast for lactation. We talked about prolactin, which is the hormone that comes from the posterior pituitary, I'm sorry, the anterior pituitary gland. The anterior pituitary gland secretes prolactin. Again, I mentioned lact in there. Remember, it means lactation. Um, this is suppressed during pregnancy because of estrogen and progesterone. But at, after pregnancy occurs, prolactin will be stimulated and will stimulate milk production. And then the hormone oxytocin, which we know is very much invo involved in the process of labor, but also very much involved in um, lactation because it's going to stimulate the release of milk from the breast. It, it provides the milk letdown reflex. The milk, refle the milk letdown reflex, what that means is, is um, typically milk is every once in a while there is a leakage that sometimes happens in women who have just given birth, um, but not constant. What happens is the sensory stimulus, the suckling of the infant on the breast causes a stimulus to the body, sending a message up to the posterior pituitary, releasing oxytocin. Oxytocin will then stimulate the breast, uh, the smooth muscle to start to contract, therefore releasing milk. So that's where oxytocin does come in. Okay, 
All right, guys, so that is the end of the reproductive systems. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop that there. And if you guys have any questions, you guys know, just let me know. I know that was kind of a, a longer chapter, um, but if you need anything, let me know.